These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. The Middle East is a mess. Non-state actors are attacking established nations. Civilian populations are upset with their leaders and tired of extended occupations of foreign nations. Those occupied people have been resisting fiercely for years. Meanwhile, climate change is beginning to threaten food security, and the leader of the largest empire in the region is increasingly out of touch. These are the decades leading up to 1200 BCE. Certainly, it's nothing like that today, because we're much more advanced than our Bronze Age ancestors. Anyway, to Kulti Ninurta, king of Assyria, has been the driving force of our story lately. He beat up the Hittites, then he retired to build his palace district just outside of Asher. Then he got attacked by the Babylonian king Kashtiliash IV and got pulled into an absolute quagmire of a Babylonian occupation. Things have since lightened up a bit in Babylon. They have their own puppet king, or perhaps a governor, and what is left of the Kassite royal house is not even in Babylonia anymore. Unless you think Tikulti Ninurta's puppet kings were part of the Kassite royal house, it's not really clear. Basically, the situation in the south is so muddled that we really don't know how many kings there were during this period. We don't know if some of them overlapped with multiple claiming to rule at the same time but in different places, or if there are actually gaps in the kingship where no known king was in charge of Babylonia and it was just relegated to an Assyrian governor. Whatever the case, we ended up last time with the Babylonian king Adad Shuma Idna, who may have been attacked by his Assyrian overlords for some failure or rebellion, and this attack may have seen the walls of Babylon destroyed and the statue of Marduk removed to Assyria. There was also another attack by the Elamites, which seems to have hit so hard that it actually drove up and managed to capture territory all the way along the eastern Assyrian frontier, including the region of Arapa, where the city of Nuzi once stood. It isn't completely clear that either of these attacks occurred. There's evidence for anywhere from one to two Assyrian attacks and between one and three Elamite attacks in this period. So it's tough to say for certain. But we'll go with two attacks from each, the second of which brought down the downfall of poor Adad Shuma Idna, who ruled at perhaps the very pinnacle of Kassite cultural achievement. This is the time when the Epic of Gilgamesh would be fit into its most famous standard form. Tales we've already looked at, such as the Enuma Elish, Adapa, and a number of other standard literary prayers were collected and standardized as well. But they were also inventing new tales in the later Kassite period, such as the tale of Nurgle and Ereshkigal. And next episode, we'll be pausing our story to take a look at this very story. But all this late Kassite cultural achievement could have ended in disaster. After all, how many great world literatures have been lost by the conquest and destruction of the cities over the centuries? And in that sense, it's perhaps fortunate that it was Tikulti Ninurta who conquered Babylon and not some other despot. Though assured in the superiority of Assyrian ways, those Assyrian ways were themselves very clearly attached to their wider Akkadian cultural context shared throughout Mesopotamia. And when Tikulti Ninurta attacked Babylon either once or twice, he plundered the libraries of all three capitals, including the ancient holy city of Nippur, and brought many of the best texts back to his palace district just north of Asher, where he founded the library of Tikulti Ninurta, one of the best sources for archaeologists to discover these ancient preserved texts in their standard forms. The value of this library cannot be overstated, both for the contemporary spread of literature and science as well as for archaeological understanding.
we've already seen that it contained medical texts by Rabbi Shemarduk, the famous doctor, and epics in standard forms, but it seems to have also contained a wide variety of knowledge in all fields, and was available for study and copying by Assyrian scholars in the capital. This seems to have boosted Assyrian cultural development substantially, and was such a success that future Assyrian kings will consider it a powerful display of prestige to found and maintain massive royal libraries. This tradition will, of course, then be copied by the Persians, impressed by the Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian libraries, and then again by Alexander the Great, which will lead to the founding of the Library of Alexandria in Egypt, perhaps the most famous, though it's not clear that it was, in fact, the largest of ancient libraries of this sort. But... Tukulti Ninurta does not seem to have been collecting these texts just because it was popular. He was almost certainly literate personally, in an age when many kings simply were not. And while it isn't clear if he wrote the famous Tukulti Ninurta epic himself, or if he had some scribes do it on his instructions, it is almost certain that he composed a pretty well-written prayer poem to the god Asher, describing the political situation he found himself facing in his final years. Tukulti Ninurta's Psalm to Asher is, like most Akkadian language religious literature, highly repetitive and not quite as nice in English as it probably was in the original language. However, in between all the lines praising Asher, such as, Your fame surpasses all else in the universe, Smiter of the evil gods, and Holy in your justice, there are some interesting bits where the current situation, at least as the highly unpopular Tukulti Ninurta sees it, comes out. In the midst of a bit of praise, Tukulti Ninurta calls out to his god, and he says, You are their broad security, their great and good protector. They trust in your lordship, and they learn from your innermost heaven your resolve. The lands have come together to surround your city of Asher with a noose of evil. All of the lands have come to hate the shepherd whom you've named, who administers your peoples, by which, of course, the king means himself. All regions of the earth, for which you have produced benevolent assistance, held you in contempt. Though you extended your protection to them, they rebuffed you and your land. The Babylonian king, to whom you showed goodwill, made sure to disobey you. And all those you treated well unsheathed their weapons against you. Everywhere they seek to overthrow your cities, and they yearn to inflict defeats upon the spirits of my ancestors. The prayer is much longer than this, running to a full at least 75 lines with three gaps and some extra fragments, but this is the core of things. It's clear that the idea of the god's lordship over the world and the king's over his kingdom are quite tied together here, for the political situation that Tukulti Ninurta finds himself in is portrayed in theological terms as a rebellion against his patron god. The king, however, is not the god, and the idea of kings deifying themselves has gone out of fashion lately in Mesopotamia. He's scrupulous to note that he is always faithful to the god, and praises Asher so highly that he even calls upon the other gods as if they were his inferior and owed him various services. Additionally, note that the idea of Tukulti Ninurta as a regent for Asher, uh, instead of in other cities, the kings are the kings appointed by the gods, whereas in Assyria for centuries now, there has been on and off this idea that the king is not the king, he's the regent of the god Asher, and the city is ruled by the god personally. Uh, and this is mostly a semantical issue. In practice, it was the same thing, but it is an interesting theological thingy. Ah, but it is important to note that while Tukulti Ninurta in all of this was politically disfavored, in terms of actual power, 
It was Asher who dominated the Middle East. And despite the increasing attacks from the barbarian Arameans, Satayans, and Ahlamu, despite the rebellions from Babylonia, and despite even losing some of the eastern territory to a resurgent Elam, all in all, it's probably a sign of both Assyrian regional strength and internal weakness combined that led to the accidental war with the Hittites. You see, tensions were high between the Assyrians and the Hittites following the Battle of Nehriah at the start of Tikulti Ninurta's reign, but varying degrees of diplomacy had kept trade flowing and peace along the border, which both nations desperately needed given their distractions elsewhere. However, while the great king of Hatti and the king of kings in Assyria wanted peace on their mutual border, each had underlings looking for their own gain at the expense of those around them. By coincidence, our players are perhaps more similar than they are different. Two royal cousins, each in charge of a major strategic region for their empire. The ruler of Hanigalbat province, the conquered Mitanni homeland, was Asher Idin, while in Karchemish, the Hittite eastern stronghold of the Euphrates, Talmi Teshub, was the Hittite viceroy. The Hittites were weakening, going through a series of tough times that we'll be examining soon enough, and the Assyrian governor, Asher Idin, saw an opening. Raising some local troops, likely a number of out-of-work Hurrian or Mitanni warriors, the Assyrian governor launched an attack and captured a number of small towns on the Hittite side of the Euphrates, taking the territory directly north of the city of Karchemish. He was poised to strike at the city itself, or perhaps at the far northern city of Emir, and may have put the city under siege while the Hittite viceroy was busy getting a letter out to the Hittite king, Tidhalia IV. Talmi Teshub expected reinforcements for his beleaguered city, and likely some were on the way. But the Hittite king also sent a letter to the Assyrian king to Kultinanurta, asking nicely for him to maybe stop, please, attacking his territory. And then something fairly unusual happened. These sorts of letters were quite frequently sent, but almost universally ignored on the eve of battle. Or perhaps it would become an opportunity to smack talk with the enemy. This time, however, Tukulti Ninurta replied by insisting that he knew nothing about the attack, never wanted a war with his neighbor, and would investigate the matter promptly. He did stop short of apologizing outright, at least in the small fragments of the letter that survives, and does make sure to remind the Hittite leader that oh, there's been violations on both sides of the border, but this is just saving face. Ultimately, Tukulti Ninurta forced Asher Idin to return his conquered territories back to the Hittites before the year was out. This was pretty remarkable, in that it may well be the first recorded instance in history of two more or less equal powers seeking peace after hostilities have broken out, without one side being defeated in some way. This is peace negotiations, triumphing over the hawkish interests of nobility. Like I said, this is not the modern age, this is Bronze Age. And this is probably not the first time that it's happened ever, but it is the first time that we've seen two powers making peace instead of war on this show, which is significant in itself. But I don't think it speaks to any degree of moral pacifism on the part of either major king. Rather, it should mostly indicate to us just how bad things are getting as the Bronze Age collapse begins in earnest. A major, highly valuable, and greatly desired region was contested. And if the Assyrians wanted, they had a decent chance of grabbing it from the Hittites. However, Things internally in Assyria are now so bad that Tukulti Ninurta would rather take the shame of handing over conquered land without a fight than deal with the hassle of taking and holding it. We don't know what happened to Asher Idin, 
but he was likely fairly unhappy about this whole situation, and almost certainly this was one of many grievances that the nobility of Asher had against their monarch, who by this point, at the end of his reign, was spending nearly all of his time in the palace and temple complex he'd built for himself, just north of the city. This increased isolation may have been taken as a sign down in Babylon that it was time for another attempt at independence. Now, the events surrounding the Babylonian kingship in the late period of Tukulti Ninurta's reign are highly uncertain. The traditional account takes the previous king, Adad Shuma Idna, as having died in 1217, then his successor, Adad Shuma Usur, as having taken the throne in the following year. However, it's increasingly certain that though Adad Shuma Usur may have crowned himself as Kassite king in or around 1216, he was most likely not the only king of Babylon at the time, and ruled concurrently with Adad Shuma Idna, or perhaps even claimed the throne during some previous Babylonian king's reign as well. You see, at some point early in his life, Adad Shuma Usur fled from Assyrian-controlled Babylon and lived for a time with the nomadic Satayans, one of the barbarian warrior groups gaining so much military power around this time. Here he lived as king in exile for a time, likely gathering Babylonian nationalists to his cause and serving as a hideout for those who opposed the Assyrian puppet king, Adad Shuma Idna, while they lacked the strength to contest Assyrian rule directly. At some point, and it's not at all clear when, he attacked and conquered parts of South Babylonia, the regions of Sumer, and even further south in Sealand. He may have attacked the Elamites in order to take this land, and he may have attacked the Assyrians, either directly or through their Babylonian vassals. Adad Shuma Usur led a mostly nomadic army, Satayans and Kassites, as well as probably some mercenaries, and left very little trace of his rule over the honestly pretty devastated southern Mesopotamian region. There he sat, until somewhere around 1200 BCE, perhaps around the time of the averted almost war between the Hittites and Assyria. Rather, he sat in the south until the situation in occupied Babylonia grew so dire that a revolt of native Akkadians overthrew whatever Assyrian governor or puppet was ruling at the time in Babylon. Then, the leaders of the revolt appear to have sent an invitation to Adad Shuma Usur to come and be the king of Babylon. One would assume that they selected him because he had some relation to the Kassite royal line, and this is generally the default assumption that he was some minor noble of that house, though of uncertain relation. However, after the regime change, the Elamite king sent a letter to the Assyrian king insisting that, thanks to various royal marriages, the Elamite royal house was more closely related to the former Kassite ruling dynasty than to this new fellow. They accuse him of being a pure Satayan, just some desert barbarian warlord with no real ties to Babylon and no legitimacy to speak of. Which leaves us in a bit of a quandary. This could well be slander by the Elamites, and Adad Shuma Usur could have been the biological son of a former Kassite king. Or it could be completely true, and even though history usually puts him in with the Kassite dynasty, it could be the case that the Kassites have now fallen, and Babylon is now ruled by the desert nomads. Alternately, there is a reading where both claims are legitimate, but that Adad Shuma Usur is more distantly related, while the Elamite king may actually enjoy a closer bloodline to the throne, thanks to royal marriages. The truth of the matter is probably forever obscured to us, and it seems that it was not truly very important for the Babylonians. What mattered to them was that they finally had a native king on the throne again, or at least as native as Kassites ever got, and they were for the moment free of Assyrian and Elamite domination. It's hard to say what exactly he did on the throne, however. 
we have what is supposedly a letter from his reign sent from him to the Assyrian king, a son of Tukulti Ninurta, saying that the troubles falling on Assyria are the result of the Assyrian king's slovenliness, drunkenness, and indecisiveness. He says to the Assyrian king, Now there is neither sense nor reason in your heads, and that the great gods have driven him mad, though the supposed reasons for this are unclear. Additionally, there are fragments of a supposed epic of his rule, which mention some sort of rebellion in the south, as well as an interesting matter of religion, uh, most notably the first recorded confession of sins before Marduk from a king. A feature will become standardized in later religious practice. The problem with these two documents, though, is that they are from much later, from the Persian and Greek domination of Mesopotamia hundreds of years later, and seem to contain enough anachronisms that scholars strongly doubt they were written any time near Adad Shuma Usur's reign. Which leaves us with very little to say about Babylon after they throw off the yoke of Assyrian oppression around 1200. Honestly, the biggest thing to happen in Mesopotamia during the dark decades of the collapse was the death of Tukulti Ninurta up in Assyria in 1197. Having ruled over a crisis period, he seems to have made decisions which generally strengthened the empire as a whole, but did so at the cost of irritating much of the Assyrian nobility. His sons, along with much of the Assyrian military and governmental leadership, got fed up with him in 1197 and surrounded him in his palace district of Kar to Kultinanurta. The extent of the civil war is unclear. It may have been fairly quiet, but the sequence of events appears to be that first the palace district was besieged, while the sons ensured their control over the rest of the empire. And then the city was assaulted, and Tukulti Ninurta was deposed and imprisoned for a time. Once the designated successor, Asher Nadin Apli, a son of Tukulti Ninurta, was enthroned and the nation was stable, they killed the old king with a sword. By this reckoning, the deposing of Tukulti Ninurta was fairly clean and easy. Whether or not this was true, it came at a hard cost for the Assyrian Empire. Whatever allegiance Babylon once owed to their conqueror is gone after the brutal leadership change. And more significantly, Assyria had been experiencing a loss of faith with the previous king for at least a decade, if not longer, before his final overthrow. It seems that simply replacing him through patricide did nothing to enhance the legitimacy of the Assyrian throne, and Asher Nadin Apli ruled for just a bit over a year before being succeeded by his son. Though we don't have any details on his death and can't say if it was cut short naturally or unnaturally. What little we do know of the short-lived monarch tells us that he was experimenting with new ways of understanding the role of the king, likely in response to either the perceived dereliction of duty from his father or the instability of his own throne. Specifically, his very few inscriptions are much more verbosely pious than normal, calling on a greater variety of Mesopotamian gods, and adding to the list... To whom, by the command of the gods Asher, Enlil, and Shamash, the just scepter was given, and whose important name was called for the care of the land, the king under the protective hand of the god An, and the select of the god Enlil. Still, all this piety, whatever its purpose, did him little good, for he would be the last Assyrian king for a while to leave any major building projects. When his son, Ashurnirari III, took the throne, we enter properly into the Dark Age of the Collapse years, and can say very little about what was going on. He ruled for five years, and did very little with that time, likely starting to lose control of many outlying territories. There may have been another Elamite attack either on Assyria or in Babylon around this time, and... Maybe there wasn't, and the single reference is discussing a different attack under a different king at some other point in time. It's a bit of a mess. <laughs>
Asher Nirari died of murder, killed by one of his uncles, Enlil Kaduri Usur, who, like Asher Nirari and Asher Nadin Apli, were all likely part of the rebellion to kill Tikulti Ninurta. He would also rule for five years and managed to be famous only for losing a war against the Babylonian king Adad Shuma Usur, near the very end of the Babylonian king's very long life. Enlil Kuduri Usur, king of Assyria, was captured in this war and led in chains back to Babylon, where it seems he was not immediately executed but kept prisoner for whatever reason. While Assyria's king was in prison and the throne empty, the son of a former top minister named Ninurta Apal Akur, who claimed descent from King Ereba Adad nearly 200 years prior, gathered an army and attempted to take the Assyrian throne. When the city of Asher resisted, he laid siege to the city and seemed to be on the verge of conquering the city. But at the very last moment, the proper king, and Lil Kaduri Ursur arrived, much to everyone's astonishment, having been let out of Babylonian prison, because I guess the Babylonians thought it would be hilarious to see everyone's faces. Seriously, no explicit reason is given for Enlil Kaduri Ursur's release, and it has it had to be like I don't know, practical joke? Anyway, the joke was apparently so effective that Ninurta Apal Akur, the would-be usurper, simply turned around and left. Then he sat around for the off-season that year, pondering what he should do, before deciding next spring that, yep, he didn't actually care if the Assyrian throne was occupied or not, he still wanted to be king. And so he rounded up his army yet again, laid siege to Asher once again, and killed Enlil Kaduri Ursur, taking the throne for himself. He would manage to rule for only two years, and do almost nothing with his time, even after all that effort, apparently too beset from within and from without by threats to accomplish anything. He ends up being remembered almost exclusively for a badly broken series of royal decrees instituting harsh punishments in his own harem for breaking rules. For example, if two of his palace women blaspheme while arguing with each other, the blasphemer's throat will be cut. Not exactly a family values sort of guy, and apparently he could barely even control his extended royal family, much less the nation as a whole. He would die after either two or twelve years, and be succeeded by his son Asher Dan, who would provide some much-needed stability for the now badly diminished empire. It's unclear if the formal territory claimed by the Assyrians has diminished very much at all, though it has definitely retracted at least a bit. However, the centralization that had been built up by the successful kings of previous generations seems to have largely slipped away by the time of Asher Dan, and many fringe areas of the empire are held by vassals rather than governors, perhaps only nominal vassals at that. Though very little survives from this period, we know that by the time of Asher Dan, the nomadic Aramaeans and Cetaeans are now running rampant throughout the Near East, and there's very little that the central government can do to stop their continuous depredations. Now, it isn't clear if Asher Dan took over in 1179 or 1169, but we are pretty sure that he died in 1133 BCE, after a very long reign about which we know almost nothing. The king's death would set off a civil war between two of his sons, Ninurta Tukulti Asher and Mutakil Nusku, who appears to have taken most of the year 1133 to resolve the conflict. It seems that Ninurta Tukulti Asher was the designated successor, while Mutakil Nusku was the usurper, and one seems to have been supported by the core regions of Assyria, while the other had a power base among the outlying regions, though which contestant had which power base is unclear. <laughs> 
Within a few months, Ninurtuk Tukulti Asher went into exile in Babylon, bringing with him a statue of Marduk that had been plundered by Tukulti Ninurta during that king's attack on Babylon. This seems to have purchased him some degree of safekeeping among the Babylonians, though he doesn't seem to have ever managed to return to Asher. Though later Babylonian kings would threaten to back Ninurta to Kulti Asher if the Assyrian government didn't cooperate with them on various matters. In any case, Mutakil Nushku's reign wouldn't last to the end of the year either, and he died, leaving the throne to his son Asher Resh Ishi. However, as we move past the year 1133, we find that we're beginning to move into a new phase of history. While historians put a big marker somewhere near the year 1200, 1177, or 1150, I think we can see that, at least in Assyria, the so-called Bronze Age Collapse looks like very little more than a period of national difficulty. Not a great apocalyptic catastrophe, and the Assyrian Empire was very much continuous throughout this period. Still, continuous or not, we're going to put a stopping point right here, for we have a great deal of other things to talk about before we let the Assyrians and Babylonians recover from what's been a fairly unpleasant century for everyone. Returning then to 1180 BCE, about when Asher Dan began his rule, and moving south to Babylon, we see that while the Assyrians were busy offing one king after the next, the Babylonians have been taking things quite calmly. Adad Shuma Usur died in 1186 and left the throne to someone who was probably his son, Meli Shepak, though for some reason he didn't tend to mention his father very much in royal inscriptions, suggesting that there may have been some sort of wrinkle in the lineage, or perhaps that the reputation of Adad Shuma Usur was at least somewhat mixed following his death. Babylon was, by the ascension of Meli Shepak, a much reduced kingdom. It did have ties with a few individual cities all the way up the Euphrates, but these were likely quite tenuous connections. And the fact that these distant cities, like Emar in Syria, were wiped out by nomadic groups during Meli Shepak's reign pretty much says it all. One thing I have failed to mention throughout my discussion of Kassite times is the slow growth of a thing called a Kudaru. A Kudaru was a massive stone placed on a piece of land that had a text carved into it detailing who owned that particular plot of land, often describing either a chain of custody across many generations or a legal battle with a particular outcome. These first start to really appear at the start of the Kassite regime, and grew out of the fact that Mesopotamia had been so badly depopulated and the bureaucratic structure had collapsed so completely that no one had any clear idea of where land boundaries lay or who owned what plots. As the Kassites re-stabilized Babylonia, the Kudurus don't ever vanish completely, they are seen a bit less though. By Meli Shepak's reign, though, Kudaru stones are coming back into fashion. Archaeologists have recovered perhaps seven of these from this period, which honestly doesn't seem like a lot, but realize that each Kudaru is a pretty hefty investment. Not only are they quite large stones in a region that's generally short on stone, but they're also inscribed, which probably took quite a while. Add to that the fact that archaeology only ever finds a small fraction of what was produced, and we get the sense that as Babylon declined, Kudaru stones became more common. This almost certainly tells us that the central government's ability to exert its will and maintain records is undergoing complete collapse. Faith in the government is waning, and so if Meli Shepak wants to offer someone a land grant or adjudicate an important case, simply decreeing what he wants is no longer enough. He has to go through the tremendous expense of creating a massive stone and sticking it directly on the land in question. Such a monument is much harder to argue with than ephemeral government decrees, and will pretty clearly outlast the failing Kassite dynasty.
But despite constant attacks from nomad groups, as well as the complete collapse of international trade, Meli Shapak still has enough control over the Babylonian core territories that he's for able to fund construction projects in Nippur and in the Sumerian city of Isin. Isin hasn't really played much of a role in our story since... Yeah, back before Hammurabi's time, but in the Kassite period, it's received a modest amount of government sponsorship and has been rebuilt as a functioning city. It will, in future episodes, have a role to play in Babylon's recovery once the Kassites are destroyed. The only other thing of note in Melishapak's reign is that he sent a daughter to marry the Elamite king Shatruk Nahunte. This would prove to be a mistake. Since the Elamites already believed that they held some sort of claim to the Babylonian throne, and this would only embolden them. But at least in Meli Shapak's lifetime, it seems to have kept the Easterners from attacking for the moment. Meli Shapak ruled a declining kingdom for about 15 years, dying in 1172, and being replaced by his son, Marduk Apla Idna. Very little survives from the 13 years of Marduk Apla Idna's reign, though we have strong indications that the territory controlled by Babylon continued to recede, as more and more towns in the Near East show signs of being sacked, probably by nomad groups like the Arameans. To clear up a potential source of confusion, these bandits are almost certainly not the famous Sea People of the Bronze Age Collapse. We will be looking at the Sea People when we get a chance, but they were not directly related to the hard times of Mesopotamia, instead plaguing the Levantine region, Egypt, and Anatolia. In terms of impact, the Arameans, Satans, Lalabaeans, Gutaeans, and other groups damaged Mesopotamia nearly as thoroughly as the Sea Peoples did in the West, but I have seen a few YouTubers and other pop scholars on the internet lumping in these Eastern threats with the more famous Sea People. It is an understandable mistake to make. Both are rampaging nomad groups who seem to appear out of nowhere and annihilate whole civilizations, but they are in fact separate peoples, though likely driven by similar ecological and historical pressures. Anyway, Marduk Apla Idna may have been responsible for as many as 18 Karu stones, suggesting that people have largely given up on the idea of centralized records and would rather have a giant block of stone on their land so they can point out to whoever comes by that, yep, I'm the rightful owner of this plot. Likely, this wasn't very effective against raiders, but it could well have provided protection as local regimes changed, as a local lord might be slightly more willing to respect such a clear claim of rightful ownership. Aside from that, there isn't much to say about him, and he died in 1159 BCE, to be succeeded by his son, Zababa Shuma Idin. However, not everyone agreed that Zababa Shuma Idin was the most legitimate successor to the throne. We don't honestly know his lineage, though he does appear to be the son of the previous king. However, the Elamite king Shatruk Nahunte, who had married into the Kassite dynasty during Zababa Shudna Idin's grandfather's reign, sent a letter to Babylon, putting forth his claim to the throne. I'll read it for you. Why I, who am a king... Son of a king, seed of a king, scion of a king, who am king for the lands, for the land of Babylon and the land of Elam, descendant of the eldest daughter of the mighty king Kurigalzu, why do I not sit on the throne of the land of Babylonia? I sent you a sincere proposal. You, however, have granted me no reply. You may climb up to heaven, but I'll pull you down by the hem of your shirt." You may go to hell, but I'll pull you up by your hair. I shall destroy your cities, demolish your fortresses, stop up your irrigation ditches, cut down your orchards, pull out the rings of the sluices of the mouths of your irrigation canals.
this whole letter, in fact, became a literary piece and appears to have altered over time, such as confusing the exact lineages of the various kings later in the letter. But the sentiment appears to have been genuine to what the Elamite king was thinking. After all, just a few generations ago, they sent a similar complaint. Though, of course, it is possible when history seems to repeat itself like that, that we're getting various fragments mixed up in different places. Still, before Elam could take any action, King Ashurdan of Assyria decided to attack Babylonia at the start of 1158, managing to annex a good chunk of the Middle Mesopotamian region without a great deal of resistance. Then, in the second half of the year, the Elamites arrived to make good on their claim of kingship, conquered Babylon, killed Zababa Shuma Idin, and ended the Kassite royal line forever. Well, that isn't completely true. There would be another fellow to rule for a year or two afterwards, Enlil Nadin Ahi, who typically goes in the history books as the official last Kassite king. But really, it isn't clear to me that he ever actually ruled anything, since his only historical details appear to be that he led an army against the Elamites and was promptly defeated and killed. Which, with whichever way that goes, quite cleanly puts an end to our series on Kassite Babylon, square in the middle of the Bronze Age collapse. But even though the Kassites are all dead, we aren't quite finished with them yet. It's been a while since we looked at any Mesopotamian literature, but that doesn't mean there hasn't been any produced. In fact, the Kassite period has been something of a golden age of Akkadian literature, which would set the stage for Mesopotamian culture well into the Iron Age. However, it is extremely difficult to put clear dates on anything produced between about 1600 and 1000 BCE. And so next time, we're going to pause the historical story for a moment and take a look at one of the great stories that has been produced in the late Bronze Age, the tale of Nurgle and Ereshkigal, a love story between two death gods that plays heavily on the pun that death and husband both sound very similar in the Akkadian language. So join us next time for Sexual Exploits, and an exploration of the Mesopotamian afterlife, as well as a digression into the fictional universe of Warhammer and Dungeons and & Dragons. Thank you for listening.